Various forms of pesticides have been used for thousands of years to protect crops from things like insects, fungi, and weeds. For most of this time, they were derived from natural sources like plants or from inorganic minerals. Although these pesticides worked, they were far from ideal. Many of them needed to be applied over and over, weren't very selective, and were themselves damaging to the plants that they were supposed to be protecting. On top of this, many were just as toxic to humans, so they posed a major health risk. This all changed around the 1940s though, with the discovery of many synthetic organic pesticides, DDT being one of the most famous. DDT was first synthesized in 1874, but its ability to kill insects, aka to be an insecticide, was only discovered in 1939. At the time, it was extremely useful because it was inexpensive, affected a wide range of bugs, and appeared to have a low toxicity towards humans and other animals. It was also really good at reducing the spread of insect-borne diseases like malaria, yellow fever, and typhus. It was initially only used by the government to help control disease during World War II, but in 1945, it was made available to the public in the US. It quickly became incredibly popular, and everyone started spraying DDT or using it to kill insects around the house. A lot of people who were alive in the US during the 1950s and 60s can probably recall the DDT trucks or the planes spraying huge clouds of it in their neighborhoods. The DDT party continued until about 1962, when an author named Rachel Carson released her book called Silent Spring. In the book, she argued that many synthetic pesticides, especially DDT, were both dangerous to human health and toxic to wildlife. It quickly became a bestseller, and it eventually led to the international banning of DDT for agricultural use. The countries that agreed to this decided that it should only be used to control disease, most notably malaria. The main issue with it is that it's a persistent pollutant, meaning its breakdown can be really slow and it tends to stick around in the soil and sediment for a long time. On top of this, its breakdown products and metabolites are also persistent and have similar effects on wildlife. This is especially problematic for a lot of marine animals like crayfish and shrimp, which are pretty sensitive to DDT. It also has a tendency to bioaccumulate, meaning it often gets absorbed faster than an organism can get rid of it. So even if they aren't affected by it, the concentration in the body can slowly build up. This problem is magnified as we move up the food chain, and the concentrations can get quite high for the animals at the top. One of the major effects this had was on many predatory birds. The DDT itself was problematic, but as it was slowly metabolized by the bird, it formed breakdown products, specifically DDE, which was actually more potent. It caused eggshell thinning, which led to a huge decline in the population and near extinction of birds like the bald eagle and the peregrine falcon. After DDT was banned, their populations started to recover. Anyway, with all that being said, I figured that it might be interesting to synthesize some DDT and to test it out. To make it, I'll be using two main chemicals, chloral hydrate and chlorobenzene. I was able to buy both of them directly, but I also could have made them from scratch. In the future, I might make some chlorobenzene, but I don't think I'll show how to make chloral hydrate because it's sometimes used as a recreational drug. Anyway, to start things off, I add some chloral hydrate to a flask, followed by chlorobenzene. I then set up a hot water bath, and I turn on the magnetic stirring. As it warms up, the chloral hydrate slowly melts and dissolves into the chlorobenzene. Once it all disappears, I set up an addition funnel that's pre-filled with concentrated sulfuric acid. Then, I swap the hot water bath for an ice bath, and I wait a few minutes for things to cool down. With the stirring on, I open the addition funnel and I dropwise add the sulfuric acid. This entire addition takes about 20 minutes, and when it's done, the ice bath is taken away. 
As the mixture slowly warms up to room temperature, the reaction will start to take off and the temperature should eventually rise to about 45 degrees. Okay, so what's going on here is the chloral hydrates reacting with the chlorobenzene to form two major isomers of DDT. The paraparo one is the active insecticide and it tends to predominate, often representing up to 80% of the product. The orthoparo one is apparently not nearly as potent, but commercially it was rarely purified out. In any case, all I do now is I just keep stirring it until the DDT precipitates. The procedure that I was following claimed it would take about an hour, but for me it was closer to two and a half hours. I think this is because I cooled the original mixture a little too much, so the reaction took a lot longer to get started. After the precipitate finally appears, I let it keep going for about 15 minutes, just to make sure that the reaction is done. Then I turn off the stirring, and the DDT quickly floats to the top as these hard white pellets. The reaction mixture now needs to be quenched, so everything's poured into a beaker full of ice. Mixing sulfuric acid in water generates a lot of heat, so all the ice quickly melts. The resulting mixture is quite warm, and the hard DDT pellets start to soften. As I continue stirring it, most of them end up combining into a gooey blob. I then put it in the freezer for a while to cool it down and to make sure that I precipitate as much DDT as possible. It ended up just freezing into a solid chunk, which I could have just picked out, but I decided to do a proper filtration anyway. I clean off the stir bar, and then I break up the large chunk as much as possible. The DDT here is still mixed with starting materials and acid though, so I'm going to need to clean it up. To do this, I first wash it with some cold water, then with sodium bicarbonate solution to get rid of any acid, and then again with water. I'm doing a lot of washings here, but it's not really a problem because DDT is really insoluble in water, so I'm not going to lose very much. Just as a quick side note, the original reaction mixture and all the washings need to be transferred to a proper waste container. The waste contains chloral hydrate, chlorobenzene, and DDT, all of which can't be poured down the drain. When I'm done washing it, I leave the vacuum on to dry it up as much as possible, and then I transfer it to a piece of paper. I leave it here for a couple days, and when it's completely dry, I go ahead and weigh it. The mass I get is 23.3 grams, which is a pretty good yield, however, it's still not very pure. To clean it up, I need to crystallize it from ethanol. I transfer all the DDT to a beaker, add some ethanol, and I heat it up until it's boiling. Then, I keep adding small amounts of ethanol until everything dissolves. When it does, I take it off the hot plate, and I remove the stir bar. Now, as it cools down, the solubility of DDT decreases, and crystals will start to form. When it eventually reaches room temperature, it's placed in the freezer for a couple hours. Then, I chop it up into pieces, and I filter it off just like before. This time though, I only do one washing, and I use ice-cold ethanol. It's all transferred to a watch glass, and it takes about a day to dry. The final yield here is 14 grams of nice fluffy crystals, which represents a percent yield of about 50%. When I first decided to make the DDT, I never planned to test it on anything. I'm the kind of person who doesn't like squishing or killing bugs in general, so I was pretty uncomfortable with the idea of trapping some, poisoning them, and watching them die. In the end though, I chose to try it out because I felt it would be interesting to explore the effects that insecticides can have. Some insecticides are still derived from natural sources, but most of them, like DDT, are completely synthetic. There are many different types of synthetic organic pesticides, which are all toxic to insects in their own unique ways. The most commonly used ones just target the nervous system, but other insecticides can affect things like reproduction and the exoskeleton. 
DDT specifically falls under the category of organochlorides and it affects sodium channels on nerve cells. It should be noted though that this effect is pretty unique to DDT and DDT-like compounds and other organochloride insecticides work differently. In general, for a neuron to propagate a signal, sodium channels on the surface of the cell need to open and then close at very precise times. DDT disrupts this system by stabilizing the channels in their open state. As a result, it takes longer for them to become inactivated or fully closed. So basically, an affected neuron can be activated like normal, but it now has troubles turning off. This causes neurons to become hyperexcited, which leads to spasms, paralysis, and eventually death. Now to actually test it out. If you don't like seeing bugs suffer, or just bugs in general, I suggest you stop the video here. A few weeks ago, we were hit with a heat wave, and because of this, my compost bin came to life. I figured it was the perfect chance to test things out, so I collected several victims in two tubes. The test was pretty simple, and I just added DDT to the one on the right, and waited to see what would happen. It was obviously irritating or annoying in some way, but even after several hours, besides this, there was no noticeable effect. I did some research online, and I didn't find too much, but I did find a book that talked about how it really doesn't work well on fly larvae. It's apparently still pretty good at killing mature flies, it just doesn't work when they're in the larva stage. So I released the maggots in the tube on the left, back to the compost bin, but I had to add the test maggots to my DDT waste container. Now I need to find some other victims, which I know it'll work on, so I picked out some ants. I put two in each tube, and I made a nice little dirt habitat for them. Then, just like before, I added DDT to the tube on the right. Also, I occasionally added drops of sugar water to both tubes to make sure that they didn't get dehydrated or get too hungry. Within the first 25 minutes, the DDT was clearly working and we can see the test ants starting to develop some random twitches. By the one hour mark, they were extremely hyperactive and the spasms had increased significantly. At an hour and a half, they're not nearly as energetic as before, and we can see the paralysis starting to kick in. When it gets to two hours, they can't move anymore, and the spasms are pretty much constant. Now, from this point on, you would imagine that they would die soon, right? Well, let's fast forward about five hours later. They're pretty much just still there, writhing in misery. Even if you hate ants, you have to admit that this is pretty brutal. In any case, I didn't see a point in making them potentially suffer more, so I just ended things here. I squished the test ants to put them out of their misery, and I released the lucky ones back to the wild. So from this, we can clearly see that my DDT works, well, at least on ants. This isn't too surprising though, because while DDT is known to be a pretty broad spectrum bug killer, there are a lot that just aren't affected by it. Also, one thing that I should mention is that the time it takes for an insecticide to kill really depends on the bug and insecticide combination. For example, I found a reference that reported DDT taking less than 5 hours to kill bed bugs, but more than 24 to kill houseflies. Other insecticides can be faster, slower, or even have no effect. Anyway, I think that's about it. I hope you guys found the video interesting, and that maybe you learned a few things. Before I end it though, one thing I want to make clear is that this video is not intended to be anti-insecticide or anti-pesticide in any way. There are a lot of pros and cons to pest control in general, and it isn't my intention to take any side. In my last video, I ran a contest where the winners could win a pair of socks that I dyed, as well as a set of beakers. The first winner is Robin from Germany, and the second is Daniel from the US. For those of you who didn't win, don't be discouraged because there are going to be more giveaways in the future. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see my videos at least 24 hours before I post it to YouTube, 
and they can also directly message me. All supporters with $5 or more will get their name at the end of the video like you see here.